I'm NASA astronaut Mark Kelly, a graduate of Mountain High School in West Orange, New Jersey. Back then, I didn't know that I'd become an astronaut, but now I know that it wouldn't have been possible without solid skills in science, technology, engineering, and math. Take it from me, education is your ticket to an incredible future, and what you learn today will help you reach for the stars tomorrow. Uh, looking forward to it. I uh, had a great uh, fourth spacewalk yesterday. Uh, a lot of arms put away, and now we get a bunch of transfer and Cedra uh, bed R and R today. So we're uh, looking forward to another day in space. And thanks for the great song. And you are so welcome. It was a good day yesterday. Hi, this is Mike Drake at the University of Arizona. Can you hear me? Yeah, Mike, we got you loud and clear. Welcome aboard. We're on board the Japanese module on the space station right now. Well, as you can hear, there's a lot of applause in the room. Um, we have a lot of different people here today. Um, we have staffers and friends from your wife, Congressman Gabby Gifford's office, who are with us. We have a number of first responders from the fire department that are with us. Uh, most importantly for us, I think, is we've got a lot of middle school students who are going to be the ones asking you questions. And uh, we also have a number of, of University of Arizona Space Grant students, which uh, your wife Gabby has been very strongly supportive of, a great program at NASA. Let me bring up our first middle school student. I'm going to ask her to say her name and ask her question. Hi, my name is Lena Ariaga from Gridley Middle School. My question is, what feeling did you have when you first looked out the window? Well, let me, let me first say, you know, for everybody there, welcome aboard the space station. It's a great opportunity for us to have a chance to talk to the folks there back in Tucson. I know I probably know some people in the in the office. We can't see you, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to have the opportunity to do this event. We just got up. I imagine you guys are getting ready to go to sleep this morning um, with regard uh, or this evening. With regards to your question, though, for me, when I first saw the Earth, it was over 10 years ago. I very distinctly remember it. I was the pilot on the same space shuttle that's docked just a little bit to out that hatch and to our left, Space Shuttle Endeavor. And at Mach 15, when you're going into orbit, the space shuttle rolls the he uh, to heads up. So it's upside down and it rolls heads up. And I looked over my right shoulder out the window. You could see this big blue planet out there. And it's really like, even though it was 10 years ago, it's like it was yesterday. Very, very spectacular view. And it's pretty exciting to get to go into space. I'm going to add Thanks. to that answer uh, only because uh, uh, I experienced um, my uh, first daytime liftoff about a week and a half ago, uh, 
and uh, to my left was Commander Kelly, and I was the pilot in the right seat, just like uh, Mark was recalling t from 10 years ago. My first flight was three years ago, and it was at night, and so uh, this past launch was my first day uh, launch as well. And uh, looking over my right shoulder, I was amazed at how uh, the Atlantic Ocean accelerated by. Uh, I do recall looking out the window and Mark said, focus, because uh, as the pilot, I'm supposed to focus on the engines and the other systems. But I was amazed at what it looked like out the window. So I just wanted to share that with you. Hi, I'm Alex Boland. And do you have to tie everything while in space or during liftoff and landings? Well, hi, Alex. Uh, yeah, we, we really do. When uh, on launch, everything vibrates. Uh, um, and shakes, and so everything has to be tied down. But then once we get to orbit, it, you know, it's not shaking and vibrating anymore. But if we don't tie it down, it'll float away. So, uh, you know, one of the big challenges living up here is um, not losing your stuff. So we we have to um, keep things tied down, keep things secured because, um, you know, you'll lose it pretty fast. But that, you know, that becomes challenging, but it also becomes fun too. So if you're eating a meal, and uh, you know you have a, a couple of things in your hands, if you if you run out of hands, you could just take your your food and, and stick it right there, and then uh, go about go about uh, you know getting a drink or something else, and then just grab it, and there it is. Okay, just like that. So <laughs> so it's uh, you know it's challenging on one hand, but it's a lot of fun on the other. Hi, my name is Mia Birch from Gridley Middle School. My question is, why do you take dry food with you and can you eat regular meal in space or is it impossible to keep the food from floating off? Well, we have uh, Velcro attached to all our food items. Mark just grabbed, looks like some dried fruit of some kind. Pineapple. Uh, dried pineapple. We have a lot of dehydrated foods like uh, dehydrated uh, pineapple and uh, we have other items that come uh, pre-packaged, all ready to go, and they're in uh, packets that we just put in the oven and, and, and heat. We also have uh, clear packets, uh, plastic packets, that we inject water in to rehydrate them. Um, and, and, and every meal is, is fun, so uh, uh, it, it's really easy to eat, and uh, the food is great. Uh, some people love the shrimp cocktail. I actually prefer... Uh, the M&Ms, and uh, it's 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 a normal diet. I made a hamburger the other day. Uh, since it's zero gravity, I was able to stick a tortilla on a clip, put a little ketchup and mustard. It doesn't go anywhere. And then I stuck the the hamburger patty right exact right on the ketchup, and it stuck uh, because of course gravity's not acting on it. And after I took it off the clip, I rolled it up and ate it. So uh, we have pretty much normal foods, no soda pop or things like that. Hi, my name is Alex Enriquez from Gridley Middle School. My question is, how long does it take to readjust when you get back to Earth? Well, Alex, that's a good question, and a lot of it depends on how long you've been up here. Um, for shuttle crew members that are up here for maybe two weeks or so, uh, the, adjust, the readjustment is, is pretty quick, um, maybe a few days. Uh, I remember on my shuttle flight about three years ago, I think it was... Um, probably a day or two before I could walk without thinking about it. And I remember when I first got back, I would take a, a step and go, okay, there goes the left foot, there goes the right foot. I'm starting to lean left. I need, I need to lean back right. And so, but that, that passed very quickly. Um, for, sh for station crew members who are up here, you know, maybe six months, uh, the rehabilitation is much longer. And um, some of the things that we do to help pre prevent or, or to, to make it so that when we get back, we don't have such a big adjustment period is exercise. And we do two hours a day of either resistance rec exercise like weightlifting or uh, aerobic exercise like riding the bike or running on a treadmill. And that really seems to help. It, it helps us uh, in our adjustment when we come back to Earth. And it also helps uh, uh, prevent some of the, or, or slow down some of the processes of just living in space, like losing uh, some of our uh, bone mass and uh, our muscles weakening and things like that. So it, it helps to counteract that. Uh, so there's a big, uh, long period of time uh, after we get back uh, where we slowly, uh, you know, do a lot of exercise and a lot of other uh, activities to, to readjust to gravity once we get back. My name is Shay Bushy, and I'm from Mid Gridley Middle School. My question is, how do you sleep in space? Well, you, you know, you could sleep just kind of floating around. The problem with that is you'd bump into you, to other people and you'd wake them up. And then you might not have any idea where you're going to um, 
go to on the space station. It's a really big place. So what we do is we sleep in a sleeping bag. It has a bunch of straps and hooks, and you can tie it to the ceiling or to the floor or the wall. Uh, last night, I slept on the floor of the flight deck of the space shuttle. Uh, Mike Fink, one of our crew members, was sleeping on the wall downstairs, and sometimes people will sleep on the ceiling. It takes a while to get used to sleeping in zero gravity. There's no pressure on your body. My first night in space 10 years ago, I got in my sleeping bag, and then I immediately rolled over on my side like I would in bed and then thought to myself, well, this is kind of dumb because there is no side, because there is no up or down. So you might as well just stay in the position you're in. Hi, my name is Kirsten Bassett, and I'm from Gridley Middle School. My question is, how is growing plants in space different from growing them on Earth? Right, Kirsten, that's a really good question because we're actually doing that. And uh, uh, we're trying to figure out the answer to that question, really, and you know what effect gravity has in how plants grow. And one of the things we're trying to do is remove, because we're in, in space and because we're in this what we call microgravity environment, we can eliminate uh, gravity from the equation. And we can uh, see how plants grow without gravity. And that helps us to better understand the process of plant growth, which helps us uh, understand how crops grow and how we can make more food. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at what factor gravity plays in uh, a plant's growth and how that compares to things like uh, moisture in the soil and, and um, uh, chemicals that, that are used for fertilizers and, and things like that. And, you know, a lot of the research that we do is so that we can go farther and farther into space. And, you know, when we go uh, to Mars and beyond, you know, we're going to have to grow our own food in order to do that. And so that's a very important part of the research that we do up here. But you know, on the one hand, we're, we're trying to discover how to go further in space, but we're also helping, uh, you know, all the people on Earth as well as we grow, uh, you know, fi figure out how to grow crops in, in areas that are stricken with drought and, uh, you know, areas that don't have uh, really good soil. And so there's a lot of uh, experimentation that we do to look at the, the effects of gravity. And we also have, you know, cameras on the space station that look at crops uh, throughout the world and, and evaluate how they're growing over time so that we could um, better understand that process. So very good question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amanda Duncan from Goodley Middle School. My question is, can you see signs of man-made or natural di disasters from space? Uh, Amanda, you can. And, uh, you know, that's one of the, the um, really good things about being up here and having this vantage point to see the, to see our planet from. And uh, one of the most recent ones is the flooding in the Mississippi River. And we were able to take pictures of that and kind of document over time the changes to the river and uh, the effect in the surrounding communities. And so, you know, volcanoes, hurricanes, uh, pollution, all those type of, uh, of um, you know, things that are affecting our environment, you know, we can monitor, we can watch, uh, we can keep track of up here. And it's uh, really interesting to see that and to see um, the good things and the bad things and see how, you know, man-made effects uh, on our planet uh, are, are making some changes that, are, that some of them good and some of them bad. So it's good to keep track of that. And it's a, it's a wonderful place to do that from. Hi, my name is Taylor Reynolds from Gridley Middle School. My question is, how does the human body change in space, both long and short term? Well, you know, the human body is, a, is an amazing thing, and it really adapts very quickly to uh, any environment that it's in. And, you know, very quickly after you get to space, your, your body starts to, to adjust. And that's a good thing, but, but some, of that, some of that adjustment is not that good. So one, one of the things that your body realizes is it doesn't really need a skeleton anymore. And so you start losing a lot of the, the mass in your bones, the density of your bones. Um, you don't need the muscles in your legs as much, so you start to lose those. Um, as Mark said, the fluid shifts. So in your body, there's fluid that is all kept towards your feet because of gravity. So once you get to space, that uh, is, is free to flow to different parts of your body that it normally doesn't. So those are all changes uh, that occur. Your eyes change shape. Uh, so there's a lot of these different effects that, that occur uh, as your body tries to adjust to its new environment. And uh, 
like we had talked about before, so, you know, some of these bad effects, like losing bone density, we have to counteract uh, uh, through other means, like exercise. So, um, like I said, the, the body is an amazing adaptive uh, um, thing, and it's, it's you know, something that uh, we study up here a great deal. We have a lot of experimentation that we use, uh, that we do on ourselves and, and on each other as crewmates. And, um, you know, we're, we are learning more about the human body uh, with our time up here. Hi, my name is Maddie Shaw from Gridley Middle School. My question is, how do you shower in space? Well, thanks, thanks, Maddie. Um, we don't have a shower. Uh, Skylab, after the Apollo program where we went to the moon, actually had something that was like a shower and I think worked pretty well. On the space station and space shuttle, we don't. So we take a bath kind of like, like somebody would if they were in a hospital bed, I mean, with a towel and water and soap on it. You rub it on yourself, and then you, 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 you wipe it off later. So it's not the greatest shower, uh, but, you know, it works. It works for two weeks for us, and it'll, it'll work for six months for Ron. Um, so that, that's a very good question. Before we go, I wanted to congratulate the University of Arizona on their new project, and I can't remember the name of it. We just saw it in the news since, we've, since we launched on the, on the 16th of May, but their project to visit an asteroid. That's uh, you know, very exciting. It's, I think, one of the biggest uh, NASA-related projects that a university has had, and so I wanted to congratulate uh, the University of Arizona for, for, for you know for that milestone in their in their exploration of space. So thanks very much, everybody. It was great talking to you today, and uh, hope to uh, see you in Tucson. Thank you, Mark. Let's all <laughs> applaud their work up there. back aboard the International Space Station in the Japanese uh, laboratory, the largest science laboratory of the International Space Station, providing a great uh, work site environment for the uh, task that Greg Chamatoff, you see here, is reviewing along with uh, Mike Fink. Uh, Chamatoff is reviewing the uh, procedures, the detailed procedures for this task, which is budgeted on uh, his and Mike Fink's timeline for uh, about four to five hours worth of work to uh, swap out the and a uh, what's known as a bed, a sorbent bed on the carbon dioxide removal assembly. It's a very elaborate piece of equipment you see there and quite large uh, that um, when active removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere of the International Space Station. In Station Houston on Space Ground 2 for Mike. Go ahead, procedure. And Mike, this is just for you. We wanted to congratulate you on breaking the duration record, 377 days and counting. Our hearty congratulations. Thanks, Lucia, and uh, thanks to all the, uh, the people I've flown with and all the folks that have uh, supported us from the ground. It's been a great uh, ride, but honestly, I hope this uh, record that we set is going to get broken by uh, future people, and this will be uh, just a, uh, I guess, a ripple in the wind of uh, humans conquering space. So uh, for, for, for the moment, though, I'm going to enjoy it. Thanks for the congratulations. And it's been a real joy, and we also share that hope with you. Lucia, just so you know, Mike's planning to break that record tomorrow. Good deal. Um, I am this morning my timeline pleasure. So I am going through the procedure to shut it down and then I'll check it out and then I'll give it to the station. Uh, so what is Glacier? Well, Glacier, Glacier is a surprise because I heard that uh, there must be some, some very interesting inside. Shall we open it? Yeah. Can you open it right now? Uh, well, makes a special I, tool, doesn't it? I guess we could, but uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, we want to. We don't want to spoil the surprise. No, no. But they do uh, experiments, cold um, uh, temperature experiments in there, right? What's the temperature right now, that thing? Um, I went already to them and it was uh, minus 35. It's pretty cold. 
minus 35 degrees. Yeah. Boy, you could like store ice cream or something in this thing. Well, no, you cannot do that, but in theory you could. <laughs> All right. Well, Roberto, uh, we're going to um, get you on video when you're pulling this thing out. So don't pull it out till I come back. All right. I'll be waiting for you. All right. Bye. So, hey, guys, uh, what a bunch of spacewalkers do uh, after all the spacewalks are done. War maintenance. <laughs> What's this? This is a carbon dioxide removal assembly. The space Look, looks like a truck engine. And we're taking it up completely apart to change out that bed in there. In the middle. Right in the middle, middle bed. Everything's so going to come off and everything's going to go back on. It's no problem. It's a full day job, but uh, we so can handle it. It looks like something that uh, a bunch of guys who've been on the space station a long time would know how to do. We're the can-do crew. <laughs> <laughs> So how long have you been working on this thing? A couple hours. Yeah, I know you guys have been hiding in here. But hey, for those of you watching NASA TV, if you fix things at home, anything like fixing your own furnace, working on your own car, you know, any little thing that you, any maintenance kind of work you do at home is good space flight training. That's true, absolutely. All right. Hey, there's one other thing in here that I noted. There's, uh, isn't there like an experiment over here that's like really fragile? That's called BCAT, and it's, uh, Binary colloids. Colloids. Uh, basically, it's looking at how uh, colloidal particles Got in it. a fluid. Watch your yeah, thank you. How colloidal particles in a fluid uh, uh, separate, and uh, it, it's over a long period of time in zero g. And, it, and uh, you can see a camera there set uh, set up to take special pictures of that. It's uh, it's been going on the space station for a long time, and they're learning a lot about how fluids behave in space. And that's a that's a really neat experiment. Tell you what, uh, Taz has a couple PhDs, and you know why he understands stuff like that. And then looking up here, here we see the uh, JLP. One by important. another Can Do crew. Oh yeah, Can Do crew. Yeah, you betcha. Um, what's interesting right here is we've done a lot of our PR shots on at this particular location, and uh, that's what we kind of hold our feet uh, down with these little uh, foot restraints. What's interesting though is they're located not exactly aligned with the hatch they're actually pretty far back and so if you just jump straight up you might hit that hatch right there i think we might have seen that, that earlier did today did that happen to you boss yeah it did <laughs> all right guys all right, yeah, wait, show wait, me a jump show it, me a jump here we go all right here both go. of you Woo. up you go <laughs> floating around the space station sometimes you'll find a bag just hanging out and uh, as I'm exiting the uh, Japanese lab, I see the CWC it has condensate written on it. And it's just hanging out here. It has no home. So I'm going to go ask somebody what, uh, what we're going to do with this bag. It's just kind of hanging out. I'm in node 2, and uh, here are some sleep stations that the station guys have used over the years and there's four of them as I kind of rotate around Ronnie Guerin and one of the Russians Sasha are sleeping in two of them but now that Katie and Paolo have left uh, we uh, have two open ones so we've been sharing um, here's Ronnie's we've been sharing uh, uh, two of these the last few nights and I got the opportunity to sleep in one um, last night really comfortable They're about uh, three feet by three feet by six feet The sleeping bag uh, fits nicely along in here and then on this side You can see laptops and other things that were used can be used to access the internet I'm actually upside down here in relationship to the room Ah, there we go. Much better. Actually, no, I had it right the first time. It's just, uh, it just looks like the laptop stowed. Also, complete with a light. Oh, yeah. Continuing on into the uh, U.S. lab, uh, this would really upset Paulo because I'm actually standing sideways it's not really apparent to me because I've not spent that much time here actually it kind of is now but this is actually the deck as we're 
This is the orientation my body is supposed to be as I traverse through this module. It doesn't really bother us shuttle guys much because we're not really used to what's up and what's down, but the station guys, it can be troubling to them if we're uh, look, talking to them upside down. Entering into node one, if I go down, you go to the PMM. If I go right, we go to node three, and then the cupola is back in there. If I go left, go into the airlock, and there's guys working in there. Hi, Box. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Very good. And then straight ahead is the Russian segment. The only part of the node that you can't go into is this one right here. It's a wall of food and other uh, EVA items. I'm going to go into the airlock and see what's going on with these guys. What have you guys been doing in here all day? Resizing suits. We're way behind. We're catching up though. Well, you guys have been working back here for like two hours. So why are you resizing them? Because some of the parts get out of certification life and, uh, and also because there's other EVA guys coming up to do some work and they don't fit in the suits that we have configured right now, so we're making them right. Get them ready. What's that, uh, what's that sound up there, man? It's a washing machine. High pressure oxygen. Oh, it's not a washing machine? Sounds like one. That sure does, man. All right, well, I'll let you guys get back to work. Thanks for uh, spending a couple minutes on Flight Day Highlights for Flight Day 13. Thanks, buddy. It looks like Roberto is uh, working on the second corner of this glacier removal. Looks, looks pretty loose now. So what, you, you swap this one with the one that's on the ISS, is that how it works? Yes. So, Roberta, what is the mystery of uh, what's inside a glacier? I don't know, and maybe I will never know. Uh, somebody else will be the lucky that will open it. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, man. We're taking it to ISS. I'm going to give you some help. So, what we're doing is we're swapping Ronnie's glacier on the station here with the shuttle glacier. See Ronnie uh, accessing uh, one of the racks here in the lab, and here's uh, his glacier, and there's Spanky going by, and then you can see our glacier, R Roberto's holding uh, our glacier for the swap out. Alright, Roberto, I present you with the Space Station Glacier. Alright, I accept the shuttle glacier. And, accept the ISS <laughs> and you get the shuttle glacier including all of its contents. Oh uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Alright, thanks Fox. I have uh, the glacier that is coming from the station and uh, now I will put it back in place, reinstall it, power on so that we can bring it back to Earth. I'm not thinking there's any ice cream in this one. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Ah. But, uh, 
All right. That's all. Okay, we got to connect the cables and the. Yeah. All right. You don't want. So Roberto, you using that high torque rod to get the uh, little hex nuts in? Is that what's going on? Um, yeah. Now I try to capture. Boy, this mid-deck was quiet, now it's just teeming with activity. How many workouts is this for you, Mark? Is that Are you setting a record? A record for me. Yes, say with me, man. I've gotten most of my exercise sessions, I'm, I think I'm one behind you. Went a little extra long today, though. All right, well, this is signing out on the mid-deck. The glacier is successfully transferred, and off to more fun on flight day 13. And uh, next is, for me, is spinal elongation. And while we're talking about that, here's a, uh, a height chart that uh, we put up the other day. Everybody's grown about one and a half, two inches. When we set up spinal elongation, I guess we'll verify that.